Uh, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to our online students. Hope everybody is doing well. Today, what we're going to do is take a look at gas laws. What are the laws involved in gases? And I know, I know what you're thinking. Thanksgiving, right? That's where that weird uncle comes up and says, here, pull my finger. Well, that's a different gas law than what we're going to be taking a look at today. Today's gas laws follow certain mathematic principles and allows us to do some kind of mathematic evaluations uh, based off of that. Now, I'm particularly um, favorable to gas laws because I like to breathe. I'm a big fan of breathing because if you're not breathing, you're probably dead. And so understanding the stuff that I spend all day doing, I think, is kind of important. That does play a role in our lives. So we're going to be taking a look at a number of different things here. And at this point, it might seem a little overwhelming, but we'll take a look at some big words like effusion and kinetic molecular theory, atmospheric pressure. And then we're going to relate pressure, temperature, and volume together. And there's something called gas laws. And then we combine them, and we call it the combined gas law. And then there's ideal gases, because if, if you know anything about children, there's what you expect, and then there's real children, and then there's ideal children. And it seems like the ideal children are always somebody else's children. OK. Well, you know, it's like Facebook. Everybody's life looks amazing on Facebook. And then you find out, oh, no, no, that was all Photoshopped, right? OK. So then the density of gases and gases and chemical reactions and, and so on. So there's a lot of different things that we're going to be taking a look at. But we're going to start out in just small little pieces, just small steps here. So to get us started here, uh, the air that we breathe is mostly nitrogen, mostly oxygen. Uh, mostly nitrogen, like 79%, about 20-ish percent oxygen. And then there's a, a little bit of some other gases kind of mixed in there. And these gases have some properties. And these, these properties here, it's, there's a whole bunch of them. And we express these mathematically because you know, we're science people and we always like to throw numbers at, thing, at things. So, so some, some mathematic principles here. It tells us volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So we say volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So that is to say as the volume gets bigger, the pressure gets smaller. Or if the pressure gets bigger, the volume gets smaller. So the inverse relationship between those two. Pressure is directly proportional to temperature. So pressure is proportional to temperature. So as we increase the temperature, we increase the pressure. And as we decrease the temperature, we decrease the pressure. This is something I notice about this time of year. I have this car and it has these really small thin tires on it. And when it gets really cold outside, the, the, the temperature goes down and then the pressure goes down. And so those tires, it seems like they're going flat every, every fall. And then you have to put more air into them because you know, it's colder out. And then pressure is directly proportional to the quantity of gas. So we say that N, as in moles, is directly proportional to the pressure. So if you add more air to the tires, you increase the pressure. So the more air you add, the more pressure you add. And then gases are missable. That just means that if they go away, you miss them. And then you feel very sad. And you're like, where did the gases go? I don't know. They're gone. They're like the what does missable mean? It's one of those five dollar words. Yeah. You can mix them together. Yeah, you can mix them together in any proportion. Right? So oxygen doesn't care how much nitrogen is hanging around. They're happy. They'll just mix and everything's just fine. It's like the perfect prom. Everybody's just getting along great. Right? Everybody dances with everybody. Okay. I promised I wasn't going to cry about prom. Okay, I got it. I'll be okay. It was a long time ago, and I'm almost over it. OK. All right, so then um, densities are directly proportional to the molar mass. So density of a gas is directly proportional to the molar mass. Now, in your textbook, it might use a big M like this. But that's a little confusing, because we've seen a big M like this as molarity, right? And so that, that's a little confusing. Um, Sometimes, or what I'm going to try to do anyway, is use molar mass, mm, molar mass, OK? I know, millimeters. But we've never used millimeters, right? So, so molar mass, OK, so molar mass. For, 
So um, anyway, the density of the gas. So the, the, the bigger the molar mass, the more dense a gas will be. A gas. Okay, and then gases expand to occupy the entire volume of a container, such as this classroom. We, there's some amount of air in here, and it expands to fill the classroom. This is good, because otherwise if it didn't, maybe there's just enough air for like this level of the classroom, and you back there, you don't get any air, sorry. Got to move up here. Yeah. So it, it, it expands to fill up the, the, the classroom. And then gases effuse at rates inversely proportional to their molar masses. Oh boy, okay. So effusion. Effusion is proportional to the inverse of the root of the molar mass. Boy, that sounds really complicated. Um, I guess we should probably answer what the heck is effusion. Okay, so effusion is, by definition, if you have, like, say, a box like this, and then you divide the box and put, like, a narrow opening like this, like a little slit here between two sides of the box. And then you put a bunch of air molecules, some kind of gas in this side, and then these molecules over time will effuse to the other side. So effusion is just molecules passing through a small opening to someplace else. It's effusion. And I think of this sometimes as science. science. I think of this sometimes as, as like perfume or cologne. So that you put perfume or cologne on and then over time, other people start to notice this. That's diffusion. Diffusion. It's kind of like effusion, but diffusion is just spreading all out, whereas effusion is just through a narrow opening like this. Right? So it, it, it reminds me, um, when, I was, when I was your age, I was dating this, this one gal, and, and you know, we're, we're kind of tight and, and such, and she went off to college. And, and she wanted to give me something to remember her by because she was going to be far away. And so she gave me this really cute stuffed animal. And, and, right? and, and she sprayed it with her perfume. And, and she was gone at college, and I'm stuck with this stuffed animal. And I'm like, I'm a dude. What am I supposed to do with this stuffed animal? Right? And then like 15 minutes later, I'm missing her because I really liked her. And she's really an awesome person. And, and, you know, I had this stuffed animal, you know, and it was like, oh, right, it's so sweet. But over time, the, the perfume she sprayed on there, it, it diffused and it no longer smelled, right? And she was still at college and I was missing her and I had, so I went to the mall and I was going to the different perfume counters and I was asking the, the people there, hey, I got kind of an odd request here, but you can just barely, you can just barely, if you try really hard, you can just kind of smell a little bit of something here. Here, smell this, right? Now, I know it means something different in chemistry, right? And does this smell like chloroform? Bad, okay? But so I'm at the mall and I asked this gal, you know, does this smell like something? And she was able to, oh, she's like, oh, you know, that's such and such perfume. And she sprayed it, right? And then, then you know, little, right? And so then it smelled like her again. And I was really happy, right? And I was, I was happy and life was good. And I, and I thanked the gal. I said, you, you really made my day. This means a lot to me. And, and you know, and it just, this is so helpful and everything. And, and so then we started dating. And, and stuff was pretty, no, I made that up. Okay. So anyway, over time, gases will diffuse. And they will also effuse, right? Because it's just random motion. It's just random motion like that. So we have these, these rules, these rules about gases. Now, if gases follow the rules, all of our math works. The problem is they don't always follow the rules. We'll, get, we'll talk about examples when they don't do that. But these are the five rules, the five rules. So the first rule is they have tiny volumes compared to their container's volume. So like we have air molecules in here. There's oxygen and nitrogen. But those molecules are very small compared to the size of the room. And because of that, then we don't really consider them as taking up much space, which is good because as I like walk from one side of the blackboard to the other, I don't like, oh, dang, ah, oh, oxygen atom right in the eye, right? No, they're very small. They're very small and they don't really affect our calculations any. Now, they don't interact with other gases. So the oxygen and the nitrogen don't get together and do weird stuff. They're in this room. They're miscible, 
But those oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules, they don't interact with each other. They just, they're off doing their own thing. They're all happy. They don't interact with each other. They move randomly and constantly. Randomly and constantly. Wouldn't it be weird if all the oxygen atoms just decided to get together and just move to this side of the classroom, right? And then over this side of the classroom, everybody's like, right? Because all the oxygen's over there, right? No, they don't do that. It's all random. Anybody here ever take a psychology class? A few people have. I love psychology class. I absolutely love psychology class. There was, um, when, I was, when I was in psychology class, they told us that um, in um, like eye contact and body language, they were talking about this, that, that um, when you make eye contact with somebody, it helps to facilitate learning. It's like, I know you're paying attention because we're making eye contact, right? So there's certain verbal cues that you get. And so we, we took this to heart. As, as students were like, oh, how can we use this for evil? So what we did is, is we, we organized ourselves. So one part of the class, we were paying rapt attention to the professor. We were on the edges of our seats. We were making eye contact. We were writing notes. Our head, right, write that down, right? And then the other side of the class, Right, you know, like a little bit of drool hanging out, right? Okay, so the professor gravitated over towards the side of the class where the students were paying attention. And then we had this all planned out because at 15 minutes after the hour, we switched. And then this side of the class just started like to nod off, and that side of the class, oh, dang, that's some good learning going on there, right? And paying attention. And we had the professor going back and forth and back and forth. We're like, <laughs> you're our little puppy now. Yeah, psychology is a very powerful tool and should not be taken lightly because <laughs> it could be used for evil. Yeah. Oh, I've got stories. Okay, anyway. Um, ah, rule number four. Rule number four. So rule number four, they engage in elastic collisions with the walls of their container. So when these molecules hit the walls of this classroom, they don't lose energy. Or when they hit each other, they don't lose energy. Usually when things run into each other, they lose energy. But these gas molecules, they, they run into each other, they don't lose energy. We say that they have elastic collisions running into each other. Our fifth rule here is that the average kinetic energy is proportional to the absolute temperature. So that is to say that as we increase the temperature, we increase the energy of the molecules. Molecules move a little faster, their collisions have a little more um, force. So, yeah, as we increase the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy of these particles. Okay? Now, these are the five rules. And if the gas follows these rules, all our math works. But we're going to find out there's situations where they don't follow the rules. Now, effusion, effusion is just that process by which a gas escapes from one side of a container to another through a narrow opening. That's just a definition on that. And there's something called Graham's Law, which is not terribly important that we know the name. But the idea is that the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. Okay, so that, that, those are just terms. As long as we know this, we're okay. Now, Here's a, a table or a, a graph here. And on this graph, on the left-hand side, we've got four different gases. We've got oxygen, nitrogen, helium, and hydrogen. We've got particle speed on one axis, and we've got the fraction of particles, or how many particles. And what you can notice here is it appears as though the average speed for the hydrogen, if you think about where, where the peak is for the hydrogen, it's further to the right than the other gases. See that? So the idea from this is that the smaller the molar mass, hydrogen has a smaller molar mass, the faster the molecules move. So the average speed of those particles is faster if the particle is smaller. So the smaller the particle, the faster it moves. And because of that, we can, we can compare one gas to another. Like how much faster is hydrogen than oxygen gas, and that's going to be related to their molar masses. So if we have this rate of effusion, we say that the rate of effusion is equal to the inverse root of the molar mass, we can take two different gases 
and we can compare them to each other. So for example, uh, in this equation here, we can say that the effusion rate of A, gas A, is proportional to the effusion rate of gas B. And this is where this equation gets a little weird, and that is we're going to flip-flop. We're going to put the molar mass of A on the bottom because that's science. Okay, so I'm going to put A here, molar mass. And I'll go, go molar mass A, and then molar mass B. Okay, so they're flip-flop like that. That, that. that confuses people. That's what people go, what's up with that? Okay, so just they're flip-flopped. Okay, so then let's compare a couple of gases and see which one's faster. Oh, I'm just fast-forwarding here. Okay, here we are. Um, Butanthiol is a yellowish liquid with a fetid odor. Uh, there's another one of those $5 words, fetid. What does fetid mean? Bad, yeah, right? You get back to your dorm and you say, you know, how was your date last night? Yeah, it was pretty nice, but he kind of had a fetid odor to him, right? Is that a good thing? No, fetid, fetid means it smells like fecal material. This is a really awful smell. This, is, this would stand out, or it should stand out. I mean, if you haven't been cleaning your dorm, then maybe not, but it should stand out. Okay, so butanthiol is a yellowish liquid. It has a fetid odor. It smells awful. And you can detect it in 10 parts per billion. So it doesn't take much of this before you're going, woo wee, open a window, all right? Now, we're gonna compare its velocity to air. Now, air is a mixture of gases, but if we just say that oxygen and nitrogen and their proportions, molar masses come out to like 28.97 grams per mole. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put some numbers in here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my, my air here, I'm gonna say this is air, and down here is my butanthiol. Butanthiol. And then I'm going to take my molar masses and I'm going to flip-flop them. So I'm going to take my molar mass of air, which is 28.97. This is molar mass of air. Okay. And then I'm going to put up here my molar mass of butanthiol. And my molar mass of butanthiol is 90. Right? So that's 90.2. And that's molar mass butanthiol. Okay? And I'm going to take the square root of each of these. I'm going to take the square root of each of these. So um, uh, if I take the square root of each of these, I'm going to end up with 9. 0.497 over 5.382. Okay, so that's the square root of each of those numbers. And then when I do the math on this, you can see 5 goes into 9 more than once. And so we end up with 1.76. And so, okay, so what does that mean? That means that one of these is faster than the other, 1.76 times faster. Now remember, the smaller the molar mass, the faster it goes. So we know oxygen has oxygen. Air has a smaller molar mass, so it's faster. So we say air is this many times faster than butan file. Butan file. So air is 1.76 times faster than butanthiol. We don't know what that speed is in like meters per second or anything. We just know it's faster, some amount faster. Now I bet you're asking, okay, so what do you use butanthiol for besides stinking up a room? Well, um, back a, a few years ago, they were using natural gas to heat buildings. And one of them blew up. And they had 300 children in it. And the children died. 
and you're thinking, okay, well, we should probably just not heat buildings with natural gas anymore, right? Because that's dangerous. Surprise! This campus is heated with natural gas. So, somebody decided, well, there was a gas leak. The gas got out, and there was a spark, and it blew up the school, and these children died. So what do you do? Turns out natural gas, CH4, we've seen this molecule before, this is methane, CH4 doesn't have a smell. You, you can't smell it. So if there's a gas leak, how do you know that it's leaking? Light a match, right? No. So somebody had this genius idea. Let's take something that smells really bad and mix it with the gas, right? So that way, if some idiot goes and turns the gas on and leaves it on, at some point you notice and you smell it. And you go, do you smell gas? No, no, you don't smell gas. You smell butanthyl is what you're smelling. And it, it has a certain, oh yeah, it don't take much. And just wait, it will diffuse. And you all smell it. When you smell it, raise your hand, okay? Because you're going to be the closest ones to this. Okay, it's coming your way. So they mix butanthyl with natural gas so that people can smell it. And this, ooh, yeah, that's got a powerful smell to it. Okay, nobody light up here. Um, and so this way, hopefully, we don't have tragedies uh, like, like they had back in Texas where they lost all of those children. So good test type question. Which gas would have the greatest rate of effusion? Which one of these gases is going to have the greatest velocity? And I warn you, this is a tricky question. Oh, I'm evil. I did something tricky here. Take a look at it. Did you find my evil plan? Did you see what I did? Okay. What do you think the answer is? As the molar mass gets smaller, the molecule moves faster. Which one is the fastest? Which one has the smallest molar mass? Oh, neon, oxygen, neon, oxygen, fight, 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 finish him. Oh, okay, so oxygen is diatomic. Oxygen gas, there's two of them. 16 times 2 is, six, is 32. Oh, you see what I did there? That was tricky. Now, when you see that on the test, you're going to know oxygen diatomic. Is there another diatomic one up there? Chlorine is diatomic. Don't fall for that. Get that one right on the test. You're going to be like, oh, I am so glad I went to class on Friday. Yes, indeed. Oh, it's paying off. Do you know that there's a direct proportion be or relationship between attending class and doing well? There, there, people have studied this. People that go to class do well or do better, right? There's a relationship. Okay. Yeah, so neon, neon has the smallest molar mass. It's about 20-ish um, grams per mole. All right. Now, how do we measure pressure? Pressure is measured. The physics, physics people will tell us that pressure is force over area. Pressure is force over area. And force could be measured in, say, newtons or kilograms or something like that. And then area is measured in like square feet or maybe square meters if you're metric. So it's force over area. Now this thing here is a barometer. A barometer is a device for measuring atmospheric pressure. And the way it works is you take a glass tube, it's like a big test tube, you fill it up with mercury, put your thumb on it, flip it over, stick it in a pool of mercury, take your thumb off, and then gravity pulls down, air pressure pushes on the pool of mercury, and they come to some sort of equilibrium. And we say that one atmosphere, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. 760 millimeters of mercury. Darn, I just showed you that we're going to do molar masses mm and now we have it over here. Well, that's millimeters and that's molar mass. Don't confuse the two. All right. I've done my job. Now, 760 millimeters of mercury, that's the height of the column 
of mercury that one atmosphere can support. Now, where does this come from? Well, there's a funny story about all of this. There was this mine, a silver mine, in Switzerland. And they're digging silver out of the mine, and the mine keeps getting deeper and deeper into this mountain, and pretty soon they start getting water filling up the mine. So they hire some people to fill up buckets with water, carry it out of the mine. Eventually that gets to be too much, so they get a pump. You ever see like those hand pumps used for pumping water? All right, so they, they hire somebody, they're pumping water. But you can only pump water 32 feet. And then beyond that, you can't pump water beyond 32 feet. And people thought, well, it must be something with the pumps. You just got to devise a better pump for that, right? Nope, 32 feet is the maximum the universe will allow you to pump water. For whatever reason, we don't know. And the mine got deeper than 32 feet, so the solution was every 32 feet, they'd have a different person to pump water. That gets expensive. That's a lot of people pumping water. You think your job's tough? Just pump water all day, every 32 feet. What do you do? I pump water. I'm, I'm, I'm between 64 and 100 and some feet, right? That's where I'm at. So we got to figure out a better solution. Now, I said this was in, in um, uh, Switzerland, okay? Now, right near there is Italy. There's like Switzerland, then there's Italy, okay? And there's this Genoese governor there in Italy, and he wants to make a fountain. Now, back in the day, this is the 17th century, this is the 1600s, the way you impress your neighbors is you have a really cool fountain. It's like having a Bentley in the driveway, right? They didn't have Bentleys back then, but they had fountains. So you want to have a cool fountain. And you didn't have people to pump water to make your fountain work, so the way that you made your fountain work was, was like this. You get yourself a hill. You have your, your chateau down here at the bottom of the hill, and then you have yourself a nice little fountain. And then you take the water up here and you run a siphon. A siphon is a tube that comes down like this into your fountain, and then up splashes your fountain, okay? And everybody's impressed. They go, ooh, oh, you've got a cool fountain. Now, this governor here, he wants his fountain, but this hill is higher than 32 feet. And the siphon won't work. And, and he's like, I really gotta have my fountain, right? My neighbors are like, you know, they've got really nice fountains. This dude hasn't got a fountain, right? You know, it's just social credibility is going downhill. So he goes to the smartest person in the village, this guy named Galileo. You might have heard of him. And say, Galileo, you're like the smart guy in the village. Figure out why my siphon doesn't work. And Galileo says, oh, that's a good the problem, but I cannot the work for you because I'm under house arrest. Because I said there's something about the earth going around, the sun goes around the earth. And they put me, and if I talk too much, right? And so like any smart person, any professor does, when their life is in danger, is they pass it off to their student. Torricelli was Galileo's student and said, uh, hey, Torricelli, why don't you figure this out? Church isn't threatening to cut your head off. So Torricelli says, all right, I'll give this a shot. Um, so what he does is he makes a glass tube and he fills it with water. And this glass tube, he has to have it 30 some feet in height, fills it up with water, and then what happens is his gravity pulls down on the water, and you end up with that space in the top of the tube up there. That space in the top of the tube. Okay, there's that empty space up there. Now, you might not have studied Italian, and that's okay, I'll forgive you. But as you look up there, what's, what's that space up there? What do you think that is? What? What? You're going to hell. <laughs> Heretic. So let me explain to you how the world works. This is northern Italy. This is in the 17th century. The predominant religious belief is that God is all-powerful. And if God is all-powerful, God can be everywhere. And if God is everywhere, A vacuum is the absence of stuff, is it not? The definition of a vacuum is there's nothing there. You've created a space where God doesn't exist. And we have a name for this place in the universe where God doesn't exist. It's called hell. And you've brought it up here amongst us. So Torricelli is not a moron. 
he figures this out really quick and he's like, whoa, 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 okay. We're gonna use mercury. Mercury is more dense than is water. So you don't need as high of a column and allows you to do the, your experiments indoors where the Inquisition can't find you. And he writes about all of this stuff and, and he sends letters to different friends and such. Hey, I noticed this thing. I noticed you know, the, the, this column of mercury and it kind of does this thing and such. And eventually one of these letters gets to, to England. And in England they have a different religion. It's called Protestantism. And I'm not getting into the debate about which religion is better than, than another. But in Protestant lands, they were like, oh, what's this letter about pressure and vacuums and stuff? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Oh, what's that you say? This will really tick off the Pope? Yeah, let's do that. So they started doing research on vacuums and, and barometers, okay? And so they noticed that this barometer thing would go up and down depending on the weather, and you don't have to be 32 feet in height because mercury is more dense than is water. So what does that have to do with Victorian fashion, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So as it turns out in Victoria, England, these outfits took a lot of work to put on, and they're expensive. And if you go out and it starts raining, that's bad. So wouldn't it be nice if there's a way that you could predict whether or not it's a good day to put all this stuff on and head outside? Is there possibly a way to do that? Nod your heads. Yeah. So any respectable Victorian home had a barometer in it so that the lady of the house would know whether or not it's safe to go outside. Fast forward a few years, there was this X prize. And this X prize was asking, can anybody figure out a way to predict whether or not a storm is reaching the English Channel? Because storms would reach the English Channel and sink ships, and cargoes are expensive. Sailors are replaceable, but, but cargoes are expensive. So they send out this X Prize. And I'm just imagining that there is somebody sitting at their Victorian home reading the paper, and it says, huh, it says here that I can get a bunch of pounds of silver, silver pounds, British sterling, if I could figure out how to predict weather. Wow, that'll never be done. And then the wife says, oh, that's nice, dear. Hey, what does the barometer say? And the husband says, oh, um, yeah, it says here that the, the, the pressure, the mercury is falling. Oh, that's nice, dear. That, that means that the weather, oh, did you say weather? What does this thing do? Oh, dear, that helps me to predict the weather. Bing. So this guy comes up with this idea. Let's take and put these little barometer doohickeys all along the coast of England. And then we'll have telegraph wires that'll telegraph that to London. And so then at London, they'll know if there's a storm coming. And then they can tell the ships before they go out into the English Channel whether or not it's safe. He collects the X Prize. I hope to heck he bought his wife a nice outfit. So there's the connection. Now. Atmospheric pressure is measured in different ways. The rest of the world does it in pascals. Now a pascal is a Newton per meter squared, but we in the, in, I can't even say English speaking world, we in America, um, we measure it in millimeters of mercury. We also measure it in tor. Now the nice thing is, is the conversion between millimeters of mercury and tor is really simple. They're the same, right? If I asked you to convert 100 millimeters of mercury into tor, you would say, well, that's 100, right? That's the, it's a very easy conversion. And that's to recognize Torricelli, Galileo's student who didn't lose his head, okay, for figuring out the stuff about atmospheric pressure. Now, there's different ways of doing it. Um, the ones that you need to know are, are right here. You got to be able to do this. Got to convert atmospheres to millimeters of mercury and tor. You got to know that. Um, you're probably more familiar maybe with pounds per square inch. If you put air into a bicycle tire or a car tire, it's probably in pounds per square inch. Uh, can Next time you're in physics class, drop this little gem. You'll impress everybody. Uh, 
Okay, all right, all right, I see what you did there, okay. Now, we have all of these different laws. We have Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and Avogadro's Law. The names are not important. They are just the relationships between pressure, temperature, volume, and moles. Now, we can put all of these together and make what we call a combined gas law. The combined gas law is PV over T is equal to PV over T. Now, what's sometimes missing in there is moles. And we'll put moles as N over here and here. And this is all initial and then final, like this. Now, the reason sometimes N gets forgotten is because if you have a container, like say a balloon, and you change the temperature or the pressure or the volume, it doesn't change the amount of atoms or molecules in the balloon. And if something is the same on both sides of the equation, you can cancel it out. So moles is almost always the same, in which case it's oftentimes left out of the equation. But you could do the same thing with the other variables. If pressure stays the same, well, then you cancel it out. So that's our combined gas law, our combined gas law. 